Why should we care about Waterton's Wall in the village of Walton, near Wakefield? It's just a wall, right? It's nothing like Adrian's Wall or the Great Wall of China. It didn't protect our ancestors from some great past invasion. It actually does have some historical significance. It was the boundary protecting the world's first nature reserve. It was built by Walton's most famous past inhabitant, the naturalist and explorer Charles Waterton, in the 1820s. It's about three miles long and was built at great expense, according to Waterton, from the proceeds of the wine he never drank. He was a teetotaler, each to his own, I suppose. Waterton's idea was to create a self-contained environment in which nature was protected from the ravages of the world's first industrialised society. Protecting something he cherished, Mother Nature, from the ever-present imposition of technological progress. We're currently walking the northwestern side of the wall, separated from the nearby village of Crofton by adjacent farmland. You've probably noticed from the footage so far that, sadly, the wall has fallen into a state of disrepair. There are big gaps where it's collapsed, and there are parts where it looks like it's been damaged by falling branches. In some parts, it looks like people have leaned tree branches against the wall to slow down the process of collapse. Judging from the prints of buttresses along this particular section of wall, its stability might have been a problem from its earliest days. There are some sections where all you can see of the wall's former glory are just piles of stone. Interestingly, quite a lot of the wall has been taken over by nature itself. The very thing that Charles Waterton built the wall to protect is now contributing to its destruction. Perhaps this bit of irony is something that Waterton would have rather enjoyed. As we walk up the current section of wall, we come to a gateway from Walton Hall. The problem is, it doesn't seem to lead anywhere. It's been suggested by local writer Barbara Phipps that since the Watertons were good friends with the Wind family at nearby Nostal Priory, it was probably an opening for a roadway between Walton Hall and Nostal Priory. I expect that the roadway would have run beside the hedge at the other side of the field and would then join Hare Park Lane that leads into Crofton. Looking out from the wall, behind the viaduct, we can see the trees of the Walton Colliery Nature Park, a site that was previously a coal mine. This illustrates quite clearly that what Waterton achieved within his wall is more than an achievement in a single place. It is an idea. That idea burst free from the confines of the wall and created places all over the world devoted to the protection of the natural world. It also helped repair land once used for industry. We are now reaching the end of this stretch of wall. You can see the corner up there ahead. At this point, the wall turns and heads past Cherry Tree Estate, it goes across a bank running from Walton Hall Lake and reaches what was once the Barnsley Canal. That is where we will resume our exploration of Waterton's Wall. During our walk on this stretch of Waterton's Wall, I'm going to talk a bit about industry. The wall and the nature reserve it enclosed were, in fact, a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. England, of course, was the world's first industrial society, and Yorkshire was at its epicentre. It's surprising how quickly Waterton came to realise how industry could have a negative impact on the natural world. The thing that makes the village of Walton unique, in truly historical terms, is that it was, thanks to Waterton, probably the first place on earth where the virtues of industrial production were actively challenged philosophically. This section of the wall is right next to what was the Barnsley Canal. It therefore puts nature, represented by the nature park, 
and industrialization represented by the canal and its associated infrastructure immediately side by side. This is the remains of one of the Barnsley Canal's locks with Waterton's Wall right next to it. You can see how nature is now reclaiming something that was once the infrastructure of the Industrial Revolution. There are trees growing out of the lock and out of the silted up canal. It's like a scene out of some post-apocalyptic sci-fi story where the remains of a past civilization suddenly become visible. We follow the now silted up canal a short way and come to another remnant of the canal infrastructure, the stone bridge going over the canal. You can see grooves where ropes that the horses used to pull along the canal barges wore into the bridge. If you go onto the bridge, you can see an opening in the wall that is another gateway down to Walton Hall. On this side of the wall, we have quite a bit of farmland. The line of trees in the distance is where later industrial infrastructure, the railway line, is located. As we walk further up the canal, we come to an area where the canal is surrounded by steep rock faces. I understand that the original plan was to run the canal along a much easier route across part of the Walton Hall estate. The problem with this plan was that the Watertons objected. That is, supposedly, why this rather expensive cutting became necessary. We have to cross the latest canal bridge to continue to follow the wall. We now pass a cottage that is actually built into the wall itself. I'm not sure what function this building was used for, but it presumably had some role in the management of the Walton Hall estate. To our right, we can still see the canal, at this point still running parallel to the wall itself. We now come to the corner of the stretch of wall that we've been exploring. It then moves down towards woodland, which is the part of the wall that we'll explore in part three. Looking back up the wall, the canal, representing industry, moves away from the wall representing the protective palisades of nature. This component of Waterton's Wall runs away from the Barnsley Canal and into the woods. In this video I'll make a few comments about the wall but mainly I'll try to draw the points raised in parts one and two together so that we can bring things to some kind of conclusion. The wall on this stretch is in quite good condition. The sandstone is severely eroded but the wall still seems solid. There have been some obvious repairs which have included the use of bricks and breeze blocks to strengthen the wall. Parts of the wall have had some sort of render applied to try to stop the erosion in its tracks. Some patches appear to have had damaged stones replaced and repointed. An interesting feature of this more renovated section of wall is that it now incorporates holes to allow animals to pass through the wall. After all, natural habitats do not necessarily correspond to the lines on maps drawn by man. The efforts made to repair and preserve this part of the wall relate well with our current theme, which reflects on what we have seen so far, while also looking to the future. During our walk so far, we've seen a contrast between industry and nature, as each battled for supremacy. We've witnessed how a resurgent nature has been encouraged to reclaim land previously occupied by industry at the Walton Coal Mine. That land is now itself a nature park, something invented by Charles Waterton all those years ago, just up the road. We've seen how the old Barza Canal has been reclaimed by nature. It's interesting to see how, in such a short time, nature has moved back in to remove what previous generations spent great effort and wealth to construct. We've also seen how nature 
has turned on its old protector, the wall itself. I suppose you could argue that its job is done. It protected what needed protection at the time. It helped generate ideas that would lead to the changed attitudes and environmentalism that will be the wall's intellectual successor. As we look towards the future, we can perhaps envisage a world in which human agency and its industry can be brought into harmony with nature. We might look at humankind and feel that it does not have an ecological role, that it has no contribution to make to the natural world and just consumes its bounty. I would argue that humanity does have an ecological role. Humans are the only animal on Earth capable of expanding the sphere of life beyond the Earth. As future humankind moves out into the universe beyond our planet, it will, if it wants to survive, have to take its environment with it. The ecological destiny of humankind is therefore to expand the sphere of life and plant it in places where life currently does not exist. To do this, industry and nature will eventually merge. When this happens, we'll see the work of Charles Waterton brought to its logical conclusion, and that will be his true lasting legacy. The last section of wall can be seen stretching into the distance to where we started our journey round the wall in part one. Our current journey is now complete.